Okay. Um, so thank you very much. I, I'm Colin and Scott's on the call as well. Um, we will do a, this talk in three parts. I'll give an introduction and then we'll take you on a tour of the Dendra website. And then Scott will take over from there and give you the uh, technical details on what our cloud implementation is and how it works on Exceed. Um, by the way, we've we've gone through the um, champion startup and research parts of Exceed so far, um, and that's actually worked pretty well for us. I, we're starting to prepare for I think it's our second, or is it third? I am losing track. Um, research um, is it third? Coming um, up on third, yes. Thank you. <laughs> um, of the renewals. Um, so you definitely can renew. Um, so I'm a field scientist turned data manager. Um, when I'm not working with Scott on Dendra, I'm getting poison oak and hanging out um, literally in trees. Um, and I tend to study the critical zone, which is the area from just below the water table um, up to the atmosphere just above the tops of trees. Um, it's a geologic term. It's basically everything we live on. So one of the things that became very clear um, working in, the, in this field is something that I thought was dumb simple, recording, um, you know, using data loggers or having weather stations. Uh, turns out it's a little harder than I thought, and there wasn't good software for it. So we made our own. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. And I should give a quick acknowledgement. Um, this project is funded by the organizations that use it. So it's the Eel River Critical Zone Observatory, the University of California's Natural Reserve System, and as Amy had mentioned, the California Heartbeat Initiative. And you'll see them show up throughout this uh, presentation. We, there we go. So, what is Dendra? Uh, Dendra is cyber infrastructure for real-time monitoring. Um, so this is anything with a timestamp, generally automated um, data logging. It is a cloud-based service. There's a reason we're on Exceed. And um, it's combining several components that normally don't go together. Um, first part is the system status, the um, getting data, from a data logger out in the field through a network to a central location, knowing when it goes down, the management of those systems. Um, this is often proprietary. It's often specific to the loggers. Um, doing facilities management for that equipment. Um, then once you have that um, data, you need a repository for it, which is often quite separate. And the metadata for repositories is generally um, in terms of um, discoverability and long-term um, searchability, which doesn't actually help you a lot with the QAQC side of things. So we've combined all four of uh, these things into a single system. So, um, and I'll describe that in a little bit more detail. This is specifically for organizations that manage a sensor observatory. And I'm defining a sensor observatories um, five or more long-term monitoring sites that are networked. If you have three HOBA loggers and you went out to a stream um, for a project in the summer, you'd, that's, um, this is overkill. Download your data, have at it. You'll have a good time. Um, on the other hand, once you start getting 10, 20, 30 sites, you're going from tens to thousands of sensors, you have scaling issues. You start getting into big data territory and you very rapidly lose track of what's online, what's offline, what's bad, what lost power, why is this thing look funny? I have a bad wiggly graph. Um, and obviously this has relevance for anyone who wishes to work with the data. And also of course, com combining the data is can be an issue. So 
I'm going to quickly give you just kind of a, a visual kind of run through, kind of give you a feel for what kind of sensors we pull data from. The UC National Reserve System um, has very standard, classic USGS style um, weather stations. These are Campbell Scientific, um, and they all hold to a very strict standard of, of specific instrumentation. The California Heartbeat Initiative works on the same land um, on the UC reserves themselves, but they're very interested in looking at gradients. They're interested in uh, transects across different kinds of environmental gradients, moisture gradients, north-south slopes, transitions between vegetations. And so they have much smaller, easier to deploy all-in-one weather stations, which they'll put several of them into a microclimate transect. The Eel River Critical Zone Observatory has um, been around for uh, 13 plus years now. I'm going to lose track. Um, they in study um, movement of fluxes through air to vegetation, to soil, to saprolite, to fractured rock, and out again into the streams. And um, they have an unusual set of instrumentation because of that. Um, on the left, we have the Veda's monitoring system. This has two 20 meter long, 45 degree angle boreholes into um, a hill slope, which are filled with concrete that has rock moisture sensors on the outside of a sleeve that gets pushed against the uh, um, walls of the borehole. Um, there's only about five of those in the world. We also have um, all-in-one weather stations at the top of Redwoods. Um, and you get amazing views out there. It's really cool. And we have all kinds of instruments in between. Um, so we have heterogeneous um, data loggers, uh, data systems. We're dealing with satellite data, um, satellite uplinks, Wi-Fi, custom radios, ethernet, various different people coming to us with a thumb drive with CSV. Um, and we're aggregating this into our system. So um, we started thinking a little bit differently about metadata, what it means to us, how we can manage the system without going insane. Um, and one of the things we first looked around at commercial software and we didn't find much. And one of the reasons we found is most of the commercial software has big data mentality, which is not a bad thing, let me be clear. But the basic premise is you have an enormous amount of data and you derive a signal through it. Um, and the outliers you just toss away, your interest is in the signal. We can't do that. We're actually doing data curation. We're measuring moments in time in a specific place on earth that will never happen again. And we need this to understand what's occurring with climate change. So we need to curate it like a museum curates data, not so much, ah, it's a funny signal, outlier. And as a result, we have to be very careful about getting the made it, what kind of instruments used, what are the vocabulary we're using to describe this? Are we comparing apples to apples? What happened out in the field? We need to capture those events. Those events have to affect our um, quality control in a way that we have provenance. So we had to work with all of these things and combine them and use our own metadata to actually run the system. So to emphasize that, um, we have the concept of a data stream. And this is going from hardware to measurement. Um, you have a soil moisture sensor. Here's a very nice CS650 TDR. Um, the general attitude towards it is instrument. Magic happens, data. Of course, we all know that's not really how it works. Um, you have a data logger, it's attached. You have um, some cryptic fields um, in the table that um, are undifferentiated. If you actually do differentiate those, you have your raw measurements, you have quality and status measurements that tell you, can I trust this sensor at this time? That's usable. And of course, you have calculations to get to your desired measurement. Not so much magic. You can combine all these, however. So this is one of our soil moisture data streams on the right. 
And this does take all the necessary information that will bring us from that sensor to our desired measurement. And I won't go through all the details there. And we do have a user interface. I'm just showing you the JSON file. Likewise, once you have your data streams, what happens when an event occurs? We have annotations. Annotations are like field notes with teeth. I have an example here. I have well water levels. Um, a student comes out once every two weeks, pulls the pressure tube transducer out of the well, drops um, a bottle in, pulls a sample out, throws the pressure transducer back into the well. It creates these large down spikes. They're not valid. They're an artifact of the sampling. When they get back to an internet connection, they submit an annotation, they're removed. All they do is say it's an action exclude, and here's the JSON for it. And you'll see it says actions exclude, true. And it gives a start and end date for that well. And you can roll it back. You can um, prove it, disapprove it. You can update it. Maybe you made a mistake. Maybe the time's wrong. Um, these, the source data remains unchanged. It's reversible. This is essentially a GitHub for data. The source, we don't have two copies, raw and clean. What we have is one copy of the data and all transformations are applied on the way out as requested. And you can turn on or off any of the annotations in the process. And so that's one of the primary strengths of what we've done. And um, to my knowledge, there isn't any field systems that do this. So um, that gives you a feel for kind of the motivation for what we've done. Um, I'm now going to tool around our website and kind of show you what um, it looks like and how it works. And our website, we have logins. This is primarily for members and curators to manage the system. However, we do have access control so that you can encumber particular data sets before publication. We have seven organizations on Dendra. I'll show you some of that. Also, at the top level, we have um, standardized vocabularies. We have those explicitly here. We can adopt other people's vocabularies and set them up here and add those in. We're vocabulary agnostic as long as it's controlled. We also have an equipment library so that you can look up various data sets. Here, for example, is an RM Young wind monitor, different versions. We have images of it, 176 data streams use this instrument. And of course, we have manuals and links to the manufacturer website. So um, when it comes to maintaining system status, here I would go to the, Andrew, the UCNRS. Um, so this is the status page. It shows locations of the various stations. And then on the left here, you see spark lines. And these are uh, battery voltage. So you have a sense of whether you're losing power or whether you just have a network connectivity issue. There's a lot of red on this because of the wildfires that occurred. You may have heard of them here in California. Um, have damaged some of the stations and some of these um, stations are fine, but they're, the network to get to them was damaged by the wildfires. And so repairs continue. So we also have images for each of these sites um, and each site has a dashboard. So these dashboards, we've got 360s of the location, current conditions. Um, we pull in the NOAA forecast just in case you have to go out um, to the site. And then we pull in um, two weeks of data for a number of common parameters, as you can see here. I'm gonna switch over to the Eel River CZO and I will do a data query here. And for here, uh, this is our query interface. It's faceted search. So for example, I'm only interested in ready to use data um, and I will narrow this to the aspects I'm interested in. You can explore the data by seeing which stations have what measurements available. Um, I'm interested in getting some discharge from the local river. Um, I'll add some cumulative rainfall and some soil moisture to this. And I'm gonna restrict it to a certain number of stations that um, exist. 
um, at Angelo Reserve. And then I have a situate, a cart of possible data streams that I might want. And I'll select a subsection of them. For um, once I have chosen my data streams, I can move over to the charting section. You can see it brings them over. I have four selected. I'm going to move cumulative rainfall and discharge to the right y axis and keep um, soil moisture on the left y axis. Give it a fun title and pick a date. You can either do it by hand, as I am here, um, though it will object if the date isn't practical, or you can just use the date picker. And I'll jump this down to January first. How about that? Close, and then go ahead and graph. You can pop this back so that you can see the graph. It is pulling all the data um, at five minute intervals, so it's a lot of data that's being brought live into the chart. There's no averaging or um, reducing of the data sets. Now you'll see that um, it separates the um, y-axis uh, units since it's unit aware. The left side is combined because both of the soil moistures use the same units, while the right side actually has two separate units listed because it's different um, there are different values coming out. Now this data, it is all the actual data, so we can zoom into an area and see the actual points. You can also turn off or on um, data sets and zoom out, and you can also export it in case you want to keep it or send it to someone. Now if you're happy with this, you can then go to the download tab. It'll keep your dates. You can enter something, for example, the title, I can create a download, then this will start running and I can just let that go. The downloads are designed to have infinitely large downloads. It's, it will not run out of memory. It will do it server side and then just simply notify you here when it's ready. And um, you can close the browser out if you want. And then finally, I will go ahead and go over to annotations just to show you what we have here. So with annotations, this is where we're modifying the data sets. Um, you can see, for example, here we had a power outage. So a fuse came loose. We've no made that notification and it has the time frame and um, who reported it. Now you'll see up here that our download is finished and we can go ahead and click on it. It'll go ahead and download. You can either just simply save it or have it pop up and um, Excel or whatever your favorite um, application for handling CSVs. So there you go. That's uh, kind of a quick run through of the Dendro website. So at this point, I will um, hand off to Scott. Um, I've given you the non-technical side of things and avoided saying how we do this. So Scott, uh, it's all yours. Let me go ahead and share now. Can you see my screen? All good? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, sorry. Um, wasn't sure. Uh, yes, so thank you, Colin. And so now we're gonna get into the, we're gonna geek out a little bit here on the, um, how this was built. And so we're gonna talk about the implementation and especially the implementation on, on Jetstream. So uh, once again, to reiterate, uh, it's important to note that we are a cloud service um, and we're hosted on Exceed Jetstream at, uh, at Indiana University. And our services run in containers under Kubernetes. Um, so and it's an open source container orchestration platform. Um, I bring this up because I think, I'm not sure if we're one of the first ones running this on Jetstream, but um, definitely uh, this is the type of service that we needed because we are a 24 seven service. You know, we have to have this data available to researchers and you know, running all the time. Um, so anyway, um, Let's talk about the implementation. So we're going to talk about the data flows first. And before I introduce our data flows, I do want to point out something that is a key technology that we're using. Um, and this is something we selected early on uh, because of the fact it's so lightweight and so effective at what it does. And it's called NAT streaming. Um, and basically what it is, it's a message queuing middleware. Um, it's used to shuttle messages or payloads or information, you know, the sensor data between the different backend microservices and it guarantees that the payloads are reliably delivered. 
And that's really important because, you know, if we have an outage, like a power outage or a server goes down or just anything happens, you know, we want to make sure that we do not lose that data. Also, too, we want to be tolerant to things like at least once delivery. So if we load data twice or three times, it's not a big problem. Uh, in fact, we don't mind having a little redundancy there because uh, sometimes um, loggers will go ahead and load data more than once if we ask for it. Um, it does rate matching limiting to deal with like different kinds of loads in the system. Uh, historical message replay, durable subscriptions, it's written in Go, it's modern, fault tolerant, and it's scalable. And this is super important because we want to be able to sometimes throw more um, resources at it, more workers at it to kind of work off that data and get it loaded into our database. So anyway, um, back to our data flows. So we do have many data flows in the system, and some are pretty, you know, hopefully obvious. Um, and the first one we're going to talk about is our live import flow. And this is the one that, you know, when Colin was demonstrating the data sets coming in from those loggers, this is the one we use the most. Um, so this is from something like a Campbell Scientific Data Logger. So for example, if you look at one of these products here, I think, you know, Colin showed one out there. We're actually pulling um, data from one of their uh, services that they have. Um, or it might be from a GOES data collection system, which is a custom integration that we have with GOES. Uh, and this is for retrie retrieving data from a satellite uplink. Um, so we can basically uh, you know, develop a new type of integration and just throw it in. We have a chirp stack or a win one coming up that we're going to integrate with as well. So back to our flows here, we're going to focus mainly on one that is loading data from a Campbell Scientific Data Logger. And there's a service for that called LDMP. So we have a service that does that. It's a custom worker. It pulls records from the source and publishes them into a streaming queue. Um, and then uh, what, that, what happened at that point is that it is forked, uh, it's loaded into the import queue and it's also dumped into an archive queue. So we have a long-term storage of all the data. And this is super important in case we have, you know, maybe the logger software fails or something. We wanna have this long-term archive that we could reconstruct the entire system if we have to in case of some disaster. Um, and then also uh, we uh, send it also to a transform queue where we decode it and get it prepared so that we can load it into a time series database. Um, and in this case, we're using InfluxDB. Um, and by the way, our design supports using different databases for storing data points. So if we decided we didn't want to use Influx and we have to move to something else, um, like OpenTSB, we could go ahead and do that. Um, so one of the things I do want to point out here that's really unique to what we do is, you know, we do this thing that we call naive data loading. And this really just means that we only do the necessary and minimal transformations that are needed to just store the records in the time series database. We don't want to modify anything because we don't really know what's wrong or what's right half the time. You know, you have to kind of figure that out once you get the data in and use the tools to kind of go through and analyze it and then maybe create some annotations. So our goal is to stay true to the source data as much as possible, um, get it loaded so we don't want to reload it. Uh, transformations mainly involve just data type casting, no computation or corrections, um, very light touch, requires very little configuration to add a new source. And so far at this point, I haven't mentioned metadata yet. This is completely disembodied from the metadata and actually querying uh, the information. We can go ahead and get a new integration up and going just by setting that integration up for very little configuration and it automatically will create the tables and, uh, and databases in Influx so we can get, you know, just get running really quickly and get data loading um, and then start focusing on how we're going to start to analyze and process and, and curate these data sets into something that's a usable product for, for users. Um, so basically our live import flow allows us to easily configure new sources and get, you know, get, get running with a little fuss. Um, once it's loaded, then we can start to focus on accessing the data using our API. Um, before we get there, I do wanna jump into our bulk import flow and Colin made mention of this. Um, this is like, you've come back from the field and you have a CSV of like a year's worth of data. Um, maybe we were collecting it as well because it was online, but maybe there were some gaps as well, and maybe that information is on a USB stick. Um, this could be a collection of CSV files, or it might be CSV files that we have um, just kind of sitting around that, um, that the uh, logger software has spit out, and we just want to do some uh, gap fill. So this is designed specifically to do um, you know, large amounts of data all at once. And so for example, this might be like a DAT file. And so for example, here's like a DAT file. It looks like a CSV basically that comes off of a logger. And these can be very large in many ways. Um, so we can support arbitrarily large files for loading. Um, you know, the idea is not, we don't want to run out of memory as we're bringing this massive file in. Um, and we bring it in the same exact way. We bring it through, we transform it, and we also get it into our time series database. 
Um, and it doesn't matter if it overlays the existing data because these loggers aren't going to change the values. What they're going to do is just you know, uh, provide more additive uh, data in case something is missing. Um, and of course, um, and then of course, we, when we read these, we actually store them uh, in, a, in bucket storage. That's going to be more effective. And in this case, um, we needed something very similar to S3. So we chose a product called MinIO, which is an open source product, which basically works very much like Amazon AWS. But we're compliant with that. So if we had to use um, true bucket storage, we could go ahead and do that. All right, so that's our um, two different ways you know, that we get data into the system. And now what we're going to do is talk about our API flow. Uh, and this is how a, somebody using the system would go ahead and pull data out. And this could be through a UI or through a CLI that we have, or maybe they want to um, write some, like a Jupyter notebook, for example, and just access the API, get a token, and just start pulling data out. And we do have examples of that as well. Uh, Colin's created a, a great Python library for going ahead and pulling data out um, in, for analysis. So our API, fl API flow is what we follow to query and manage the metadata. We do all that with it. We do the metadata and we do data. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to focus mainly on how we get data points, because that's the more interesting use case here. Um, so in order to get data points, you got to have metadata. And so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about, we're going to look a little bit deeper at that data stream. And to do that, you have to create a data stream. So, um, so the data stream basically is like a name, you know, some other you know, information about the equipment, um, and also you know, the vocabulary that we use to access it in a faceted search. And you know, incidentally, we can set this thing up and start to pull data. And if we find out that the vocabulary is wrong or the way we index it is wrong, it's very easy to change that stuff and it doesn't break things. And then we have this thing called our data points configuration. And so what we do is we set this up and it tells Dendra, where is the data at? Is it an influx? Is it in SQL? You know, where is this stuff at? Because we don't want the user to worry about those things. We want to give the user a very nice polished data stream that they can go ahead and start to work with. So once this configuration is set up, which tells them where's the data, um, you know, for, you know, for how, what period of time and what database is it in, um, once this is uh, created, then what happens is a Dendro will go through and build a new configuration, a built configuration that incorporates any annotations. And this is interesting because, you know, you're gonna have all these annotations that are gonna go in there and make exceptions. They're gonna say like, I have, to, I have to change the calculation at this point in time, or I have to exclude, create a gap because it was a spike. Um, so what it'll do is it'll take your configuration, which says, where's the data at? Then it'll go through and say, okay, I'm gonna make a new configuration, which says, here's all the changes and here's all the um, you know, uh, modifications that have to be dealt with. And if you add a new annotation, it'll go through and make a new configuration. This configuration is super important because it tells a story. When you look at the data stream, you can actually see, here's where the data came from. Here's what happened to it when I started pulling data from this time slice and so on. Um, so once that is generated, that's what's used to go ahead and fetch the data points. So we're gonna walk through a call here. Step one, you have a client, like a web app or something that's trying to fetch some data points. So it submits an HTTP GET to the, um, to the API. Step two, we authenticate the call and, and do some uh, basic uh, validation. Step three, the data stream metadata is fetched. So we pull that from, we store that in MongoDB because we're using JSON. Um, and then we go ahead and we start working off that configuration and saying, well, where's the data at? Um, and what things do we have to consider you know, as we're fetching data? So we go ahead and start doing all that fetching, um, pulling it in this case, usually from InfluxDB. And then step four, go through and we do some calculations maybe. There might be some corrections we have to do. Sometimes the data stream requires a uh, formula as Colin had noted in one example there um, to kind of make it more usable. Um, and this is all done in real time. Also we'll do some exclusions. So if there's like a gap, we have to just drop out some data. We can go ahead and do that. So the researchers don't have to deal with um, uh, like negative values that might be extreme. Um, which is really cool here is if the calculation is wrong or something is off with it, we can just go in and change the annotation and everything is fixed in real time. So the next time you go fetch it, it's ready and we don't have to reload the data. Um, and then of course, on step five, the data points are returned to the caller. So what's really nice about this is that the way the API works and the way the data services work is a single data stream can seamlessly fetch data from multiple databases to provide a single continuous time series result. And so examples where we have this going on right now is uh, when we started Dendra, we had everything in a SQL database using um, a different kind of data model actually. So we were able to not worry about the big migration um, that is very fearful at times where we get to move all the data over and worry about it. We were actually able to query data from SQL and then seamlessly stitch that together with data that we were storing in Influx, but the user never knew the difference. Um, so it allows us to do things like deal with legacy data sets, deal with data sets stored on different servers. And in fact, we're going through a migration now where we're moving to a new cluster and it's actually completely transparent to the user. We're just pulling data from one influx and then going to another influx until it's all moved over. 
um, this abstraction of the data stream also insulates the user from needing to know where the data is actually stored. So we can actually position tables on any server to meet requirements such as for performance or security as well. We actually have this for different organizations. Every organization has our own influx instance, just so we keep everything very separate and performant. Um, and what's really kind of cool too is that the Dendro's API is also a data source. So we can actually, uh, for example, like for the NOAA data, we pull data from another API, but it just is another data stream to us. Same thing for Dendra. So if we have to do composition and bring data streams together to make a new data stream, we can go ahead and do that and just call our own API to build those data sets. So that's the uh, API flow. There's another flow that we can mention here really quick is a bulk export flow. And it seems kind of like, oh, a download, not very exciting, but this is a big challenge for us. You know, how do you produce an arbitrarily large download and not blow out the memory or have any kind of issues with that, uh, you know, just, just not working. And, you know, the use case does exist. Someone will go in here and say, I want 10 years of all the data streams. And this, this happens. I literally want to download the whole database. And the user tolerance of time. They don't care if it takes an hour or a couple hours to generate that download. They just want it to work. And we want it to be correct. And we want to incorporate all of the annotations. So the bulk export is implemented on the back end. It allows for arbitrarily large downloads. Um, and so what we do is we basically just do this in chunks. We have, uh, you know, it spins up a process. It goes through and just starts to sequentially fetch data points from our API. Um, it serializes the data, point, data points to a CSV record. We're using node streams for this, uh, compress the chunks, and then write them to bucket storage in chunks. And then from there, we generate a pre-signed URL where we can download it. So it's all just very, very, uh, you know, quick and easy. I mean, not quick necessarily, but in this case, you know, it just takes, it's very reliable as far as the sense that we're just sipping memory as we're doing this. So what we're gonna do now is jump quickly to the software stack. All the components you saw before, are now here in a stack. And what we've done is we've broken the system up into kind of clear areas of the front end and back end. Um, you know, the front end will definitely be more focused on things such as servicing uh, data and metadata requests and pulling some things from databases. And then we have the back end, which is primarily focused on data loading and job processing. And then what we do is we have web hooks between the two sides that um, allow them to communicate with each other. Um, all services are running containers under Kubernetes, um, which is an open source container orchestration platform. Services can also be scaled out or run under another orchestration platform. So for example, Docker Compose. And just a fun fact is in the, in the beginning, um, you know, when we started Dendro and we started building like the preview environment, this was running under, uh, on a server under Colin's desk using, uh, using Docker Compose. So now we're, now we're growing up and then we're actually moving it to, we're on a three node cluster now, we're moving it to a, a 10 node cluster. Uh, we're in the middle of that migration now. Um, and that's segue into the last slide here, which is our production deployment. So we're running on open, uh, under OpenStack on Exceed Jetstream at Indiana University. We have our own custom Kubernetes uh, cluster that we've set up um, using all the different uh, you know, cloud-based resources that are available, um, you know, such as uh, servers and, um, and attached storage. Um, and we are now migrating to this 10 node cluster that you see here from a three node cluster. And we're keeping high availability in mind. So the idea is if we lose something like a node, this will be up and running all the time. Um, an example of that is three Mongo instances that we have, which are replica sets, just to make sure our, data, uh, our metadata is available at all times. So I know I talked fast, and that was, but that was the express run through all the details. Thank you, Scott. That was fantastic. And thank you, Colin. And Colin, thank you for answering all of these questions in the chat. This is fabulous.